take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate, and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out his plan for us. So welcome to church. Good morning, everyone. Oh, we're light on so far. We'll see how much it fills up in the next 10 minutes. Lovely to see you here. Welcome to Livingston Church today. I'm Andrea. This is my husband, Steve. Um, and we are very blessed. We, a couple of weeks ago, we got to spend a, nine days up north and travelling about. And it's beautiful to get out and about. We don't take it for granted. Uh, we have a daughter in Melbourne who can't go more than five kilometres from home. So we definitely bear in mind how blessed we are to be in WA and to have such beautiful things to see. A um, couple of my highlights were uh, snorkeling, which I love. I just love seeing the fish and the coral under the sea and uh, just how beautiful it is because it's not something you see every day when you're walking around. And for me, the other highlight is, well, I love, um, I love weather. I love the sky. Every night after I've cleaned up the kitchen, I always take my little rubbish bag out the front and I look up and I always like to see where the moon is, how many clouds are about the stars and so forth. And we were up north and Lindley said to me, look up, and I was blown away at the stars. Um, and the next night in Exmouth as well, just looking up at that beautiful array that God has put up there of the stars with no light pollution from Perth, it was just mind-boggling. I was amazed. And that was, I think, pr probably a highlight for me of one of my favourite things and just thanking God for putting that there for us to enjoy. One of uh, my highlights from our trip was taking a few photos of some of the wildlife. And one picture that I've got on the screen there today is of, uh, of an osprey in Yardi Creek. We did a little trip down Yardi Creek and, and here's an osprey sitting on its nest. Now, I don't know if this story is true, but the, the guide assured us that this nest had been in its position for over 100 years. It had stood the test of all of the the storms and the tempests and everything that nature had been able to throw at this nest, it had stood the test of time and been able to withstand those tempests. And it made me think of, of the God that we have that provides protection for us in our times of trouble, in our times of tempest, and that we can retire, if you like, to our nest in the cleft of the rock and, uh, and seek that protection and security. And that reminded me of Psalms and a couple of the, the quotes in Psalms, like Psalms 18, verse 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my refuge in whom I take ref my God is my rock in whom I take refuge. And also Psalms 5:11. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them forever sing for joy. Our church, when we come together as a community, is a little bit like that nest on the rock. It's always there for us to retreat to, to call home. It'll always demonstrate that protection and God's love for us. So as we worship today, we invite you to, to take rest, to take respite, but also to remember that Jesus is always there as your refuge and that we should be each other's refuge in whatever tri times of trouble we're going through. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to Livingston. Good morning, church. How great is it to be the weekend and especially the Sabbath where we can all come together and just worship together and catch up with one another. So I'd like to invite you all to stand with us as we sing our first song, Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you pay, bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this 
this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail pierced Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and in praise. Worthy is the Lamb, seated on the throne, crown you now with many crowns, you reign victorious, high and lifted up, Jesus Um, this next song is probably one of my favorites, and I love how it talks about how God's love is never ending and it's always there and everlasting. Um, so keep standing and singing with us.
Good morning. If you don't know me, my name's Tony Lambert. I'd like to thank our young musicians for leading out in our worship today. Thanks, guys. They do a, a fabulous job. Now it's come time for us to, uh, to talk to God in prayer. So I'd invite you, if, you, if you're able, to, to kneel. If not, uh, just uh, sit where you are and feel comfortable as we talk to God in prayer. Thank you. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing love, your never-ending, everlasting love. Um, We thank you for being a caring God that um, watches out over each and every one of us. We thank you for your um, creativity in creating this this world. And when we sort of walk around in in nature, we're just always blown away with the, the beauty of creation, whether it's from a mountaintop or walking on the beach, or like Andrea, just sort of uh, snorkeling over the, the reefs and the fish. we just amazed at uh, your ability to create all forms of life. But we thank you for being such a, a caring, compassionate God as well. Also a forgiving God, because we often fail and let you down, but you're always so willing to um, put your arms around us and just show us love and forgiveness. And we pray that we each one, as we accept your love and forgiveness, that we might be more willing to show this compassion and love and forgiveness to the people that we come in touch with through our daily lives, whether they're family members, our friends, our neighbours, our work colleagues, our school friends. Help us to, um, to represent you in a real positive way that we can have a, um, a positive influence on, on those people. Dear God, as you know, the the world is in crisis at the moment and this wretched coronavirus is having such a a negative impact right around the world. There's thousands of people dying and there's lots of people that are so badly affected from the virus in one form or another. Lots of people have, um, have lost their jobs. Other people are having to work really hard at the moment and you know their individual needs and we just pray that you'll bless our our leaders, particularly our our government leaders and world leaders, help them not to sort of point the finger at each other, but to collectively work together. We might find a um, a vaccine and and be able to um, overcome this this problem. But we thank you, God, that we can talk to you. We thank you for always being there for us. And now as we we focus our attention on you as our our saviour and friend, We pray a a special blessing, an outpouring of your spirit on each of us. And we ask that you might indeed bless our our pastor, Andrew Skeggs, as he leads out in our our service today. Take care of us each one, we pray in your name. Amen. Another important part of our worship is being able to, um, to express our thanks through our offering. And so if you're able to uh, give an offering today, that would be really appreciated. And the offering today is for the um, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Island and ethnic communities. And a lot of these people are, um, because of isolation and various factors, are often disadvantaged and and in need. So um, the money that you'll be giving today will assist in providing education programs and activities to assist these people in having a a better life. So um, if you're able to give... That would be uh, really appreciated. So the deacons are going to come forward now. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about our next song, and one of the things it reminds me of is uh, Job and how Job, in the good times and in the bad times, he continued to praise, praise God and to be content with what he had. And um, this song just really reminds me, if you listen to the verses in the song, it really... Yeah, it's good to remind ourselves that even in the bad times and even in the good times, we still need to praise Jesus and be thankful for what we have in our lives. So um, when you're able to stand and join us. Oh, 
Thanks, worship team. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Um, we might have a kid's story, I think. This wasn't on our schedule, but you know, there's a few kids here. So come on down, kids. And uh, while they are doing so, I hear someone running down. That's what I like to see. Thank you. Hopefully this story will be worth running to. Just while they're coming, yeah, just a couple of things. Number one, yeah, thanks to those who are continuing to put the effort in for the two services. Really appreciate that. It's a bit of work, but it's good. And uh, I'm also really grateful for the pioneers who built a big building here at Livingston. Um, I ran into uh, one of my former church members from North Beach yesterday at the shops, and he said, well, our building's so small, we're very limited with restrictions, how many people can meet, and, I, and my family hasn't been for quite a while. And then I've got friends at Cannington Church, again, a very small building, very limited. They're not actually having services at the moment. They're just meeting in small groups because of the limitations. So we're very blessed here, which is really good. And one more thing, a bit of shameless promotion. I'm, going to, I'm acting soon. I'm in a play. Some of you might have seen the flyer. There's a group of us putting on a play about Lindy Chamberlain and her fight for justice. October 17 and 18, it'll be Saturday night, Sunday, Avo, Sunday night. There's myself, Jasmine Lambert, Charlene Grossi, Chris Fabian, and, and directed by uh, Terry Lambert. So all Livo people, past or present, and yeah, hopefully it'll be good. I'm trying my best. You're probably thinking, can he act? We'll come along and see. There you go. 
It'll be fun. So yeah, you get a flyer, and it's not on here. It's at up at Calamunda, but it'd be worth seeing. It's a good play, and we're trying to do it justice. Okay, kids. Now, sadly, the Skeggs kids are a bit sick today, but some of you know our little twins, Kira and Kaylee, with her curly hair, the crazy hair. Now, when they were like really little, like two. When we'd start running the bath, they'd hear the sound and they'd run to the bathroom. Woohoo! Because they loved having a bath. But now that they're all grown up and they're three and a half, sometimes I say it's time for a bath and they're like, no, daddy. Because they want to watch kids' YouTube or something. You know, and we're like, oh, come on, it's time for a bath. <laughs> so sometimes when I like really need to get them to the bath and they're not respecting my fatherly authority, I just pick them up and carry them to the, to the bath. Just like grab them, sometimes upside down, you know, carry them off. Oh, sorry. But anyway, so I try that, but I'm thinking that ain't going to work when they're like big. We're going to have to work something out soon, aren't we? Uh, did you know, um, my, uh, do you know some kids don't like taking baths? That's right, some kids don't like it. And they run away from the bath. That's true. It, it, Oh, uh, yeah, I know. It's always good to have a watch. So anyway, so this illustrates the principle. Sometimes someone is looking for you, but you have to choose to be found. Like if you keep hiding, they won't find you unless they're really, really good at looking. So you know the story where Jesus told about the lost sheep? Yeah. So how many sheep were not lost? Does anyone know? 99. So the guy had 100 sheep, 99 were okay. How many were lost? One. One. Okay, there was one lost. Now imagine that shepherd went out looking, looking everywhere, looking, looking up mountains, down by rivers. Imagine if when he, when he got there and found the sheep, if the sheep had said, no, I'm not coming home. Maybe it was like Kira and Kaylee. Maybe it did say no and he just picked it up and carried it anyway. I don't know. I think the sheep was probably a bit hungry and would, was keen to come home. Who knows? But still, what if he said, no, I won't come? So you have to choose. And then Jesus also told a story about a son that said, Dad, I'm leaving. Went away, spent all the money, the prodigal son, ran out of cash, was eating the pig food. He's like, oh, no. But he had to choose to go home. Was his dad wanting him to come back home? Yeah. Yeah. How do we know? Because when he eventually turned up, even though he'd been a naughty boy, did his dad go, you naughty boy? Is that what he did? No. He ran out and hugged him. He went, glad to see you, man. And he had a party. In fact, he... His brother was a bit like, what? He doesn't deserve a party? And that was true. He didn't deserve a party. But his dad's like, I don't care. I love you. I'm having a party because I'm just so glad to see you. But he had to choose to come home. So I'm going to talk a bit about that today because, you know, on the one hand, God loves us, but we have to choose to receive his love. If we say no, 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 then we don't get it. It's like if I said, here's your birthday present, and you said, nope. Imagine that. That wouldn't happen, would it? Well, don't, don't refuse God's birthday presents either. Okay, good on you guys. You can go back to your seats. <laughs> you like that one. How good do we have to be? That's the question I want to look at today. I had a friend uh, when I was studying to be a pastor at Avondale College named Don. And Don really wanted to be a youth minister. And when we graduated, he was a good youth minister for a number of years. But by the time we got to the fourth year, he was not really into the study. Like he wanted the job, but he didn't want to learn anything more. And he's like, oh, I'm sick of reading books. I'm sick of writing essays. I'm just sick of all this academic stuff. And he said to us, I'm going to do the minimum possible to pass. Like 50%, that's it. I just don't want to do any more work. We're like, Don, you're really you're sure? He's like, okay. So he does his essay and he shows it to us and we're like, Don, that is pretty rough. You know, you really could have put a bit more effort in. He says, eh, it's the right length, 
it, the sentences more or less make sense. I'm just going to hand it in. It'll be all right. Like, I don't know about this. Anyway, our lecturer, Dr. Ray Rowanfield, gave him 48%. <laughs> just to teach him a lesson about at least putting a bit of effort in. And so he had to work hard for the rest of the semester to pass. It was a bit of, the joke was on him. How good do we have to be? What's the pass mark? Well, it's interesting. It talks in the Bible about we all have to face the judgment one day. Like, judgment for eternity. Are we going to make it or not? Here's uh, one instance, 2 Corinthians 5. Paul says, Our goal is to please him, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We'll each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. And this is one of the things that Seventh-day Adventists emphasise. You know, Christians emphasise different things. It's something we've emphasised over the years. The reason being, the very early Adventists initially thought Jesus was going to return in the year 1844, and then when he did, they went, oh, we got that wrong. Well, they said, well, what we think's going on is that this is like the judgment time leading up to Jesus coming. So we're sort of in the, you know, the end zone, as it were. That's what they thought the Scriptures were saying. So we've talked about the judgment. Unfortunately, sometimes when we've talked about the judgment, we've made it really scary. You know, you talk to people who were sent to Venice 40, 50 years ago, they were like, oh, man. Everyone was like, are you going to pass? Are you good enough? And they got a bit alarmed about it all. So judgment is a reality in the Bible, but we have to understand it in the light of Jesus' other teachings because the interesting thing is, of course, Jesus, one of his characteristics is that he was non-judgmental towards people. He was very accepting to people. Uh, Luke 15, where it talks about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. The introduction is the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, one of the things that you would do as a first century Jew was you were very particular about who you would eat with. So today, if you're a vegetarian, you'd be probably happy to sit at the same table as someone eating meat. Like, you're like, oh, you know, just because I don't eat meat doesn't mean we can't sit at the same table, right? We'll eat different stuff, but we'll eat at the same table. Well, that's not how they did it back then. It's like, no, 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 you didn't even sit down to eat with someone unless they were doing the right thing. Because eating was a sign of, like, acceptance, and you didn't accept people who were doing the wrong thing. Jesus blew all that out. He didn't follow that norm. He said, nope. I'm going to eat with all sorts of people. And he welcomed sinners and ate with them. And that's why he told those famous stories to say, hey, God's love looks beyond all that and it's non-judgmental. Here's another one, Luke chapter 14. He tells the story of a man who prepares a giant feast, sends out lots of invitations. And a lot of people he sends invitations to say, no, we can't come. He's like, ah, I've got all this food. Don't want it to go to waste. So he says to his servants, all right, invite the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Invite them to come. They deserve a bit of joy, and so they come. And then there's still room. And then he does what any parent of a teenager would not want to see happen. He says, okay, ask anyone you want to come, like anybody. And you're like, oh, man, I'm, we're going to end up on the Channel 7 News here with like 500 teenagers in our street and like police cars, and <laughs> it gets a bit ugly. So normally we're like, no, 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 there's got to be a bit of a screening process. We don't just want anybody to turn up. We don't want like some viral message on Facebook and half the country turns up. But that's what Jesus said. This is the, like this picture of the kingdom of God. Like anyone who wants to can come regardless of their background, their lifestyle, their decisions. They can just come and be part of this. Quite amazing. And then Paul, thinking about this, says, well, yeah, you know, one of these texts that launched the Protestant Reformation for Martin Luther in the 1500s. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. And so it's very much about God's gift. You know, it's not our works. We can't earn our salvation. We can't, you know, sort of get to some pass mark where God says, well, I have to let you in because you're so good. He's like, no, no. We're all sinners and, and salvation is, is a gift, an unmerited gift. 
and we believe and we receive it. So you think, well, how does all that fit together? That's interesting. And then the other interesting thing is, as well as talking about the judgment and talking about grace, Jesus also challenges his disciples to be really committed. You think, well, it's all about grace. How does that fit together? He says things like this, Luke 14 again. If you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. You're like, wow, that's, that's a big challenge, isn't it? And we think of the story of the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he's like, what do I have to be, do to be on your team? And Jesus names a few things. He's like, yep, checklist, check, 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 done that, done that, done that. And Jesus is like, hmm, would you be prepared to give up everything you have? And he's like, ah, uh, no, no, wouldn't do that. And so this is a challenge, you know, the cost of discipleship. What about this one, Ephesians 4, you know, to be a Christian, you've got to live a different sort of life. He says, hey, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, no longer live as the Gentiles do, and he's using the term there to mean, you know, people who aren't Christians, basically, in the futility of their thinking, live as children of light, live a different life, for the fruit of the light continues consist in all goodness, righteousness and truth and find out what pleases the Lord. How about this one? Now we've got the uh, church nominating committee process coming up and this, this text could freak a few people out. An elder must be a man whose life is above reproach. Now I know Tony Lambert fits that category, the rest of us are still struggling. <laughs> above reproach is like, wow, that's a high calling, isn't it? Faithful to his wife or partner, you know, it can be ladies these days as well. Must exercise self-control, live wisely, have a good reputation, must enjoy having guests in their home, must be able to teach. It's a really high calling, high ideals. And here's one uh, from Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, I would say you should never quote verse 48 there without verse 44 because some people who do get into some really weird dead ends. If you just say, Jesus said we should be perfect, everyone's like, oh, man. And the interesting thing is some people who think they're perfect, they've sort of arrived, well, usually you have to ask their wife or kids or their brother or sister and they remind them, no, you're not actually perfect. Now, we all have humbling factors around us, don't we? It's actually contextually talking about being perfect in love. Like it's linked back to verse 44, loving your enemies. But nonetheless, even in that sense, you know, loving our enemies as perfectly as our father does, that's a high calling. Even if we're not like sinless, it's still a high calling to be perfected in loving for others. And lastly, uh, there's this text which Adventists have very been, it's been very dear to them over the decades God's end time people, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. And so there's this calling, you know, particularly as we move into the very end times before Jesus comes, wherever that might be, to, you know, be, be incredibly loyal to God, to keep his commandments, to do what he says, to be obedient and to be faithful. And this is the, the calling in Scripture. So you sort of think, how does all this work? Like on the one hand, we're saved by grace. God accepts us despite our faults. On the other hand, he calls us to holiness and quite a high standard. And then lastly, it talks about where we have to face judgment. And so if you're like me, when you hear all that, you think, hmm, how good do we have to be? How does that all sort of fit together? Well, let's explore it for a bit today. Well, there's a few options that people take when they put this together. <clears throat> Number one is uh, what we call legalism. That's where you go, oh boy, I've got to really, really keep the rules and really, really be good. Otherwise, God is not going to love me. And an extreme form of that is perfectionism. And we go, well, you know, I've just got to be like a perfect Christian and stop sinning. 
The problem with this is it sounds good on paper, but most people sooner or later figure out they can't actually do it. I had a friend named, uh, well, it's still a mate of mine, Scott Charlesworth. And Scott was at Avondale with me back in the 80s, and then he left Avondale and he joined an ultra conservative breakaway group in Adventism. Uh, for those of you who sort of know ancient history, uh, it was led by Russell and Colin Standish in the States. And so they were like really hardcore and they were saying, yeah, we've got to get back to, you know, the good old ad old time Adventism and we've got to be really conscientious about keeping the law and keeping the, the standards and being really, really good and it was all this sort of stuff. And Scott was really into that for a while and he worked with them in the States in their ministry and in, in, in the educational stuff they were doing. And then one day he said, it was like the scales fell from my eyes. Like Paul, he said, you know, this doesn't actually work. Like we're not perfect and we're not being very loving. And he left. I hadn't heard about the fact that he left. You know, the last I heard was that he joined this group and I thought he was happy with him. And then someone said to me, Scott Charlesworth is now a theology lecturer. And uh, I'm going... That can't be the same guy. Like, has he rejoined the mainstream Adventist church and he's now in a theology lecture? I'm going, is that the same fellow? Surely there can't be two Scott Charlesworths. Anyway, I caught up with him along the track. He came to Perth for a conference. I said, it's you. He's like, yeah, it's me. It's the same guy. I said, tell me your story. Like, how could this be? You've been on this incredible journey. He said, well, sooner or later, I just figured out that, you know, for all the good intentions that these guys had, it just wasn't working. It was a dead end. Now, as a pendulum swing away from that, sometimes people go into complacency. They're like, well, we can't be perfect, so let's not even try. You know, it doesn't matter. What's the minimum we can do to, to sort of be a Christian? Um, you can do that. If you sort of pushed me to the theological wall, I could say, well, yeah, you, you know, you'll still, if you except faith in Jesus, you can be a fairly complacent Christian and still make it, I guess, but it's not a very good way to live. Because it's like our kids, you know, our young people in our families or our church, we want the best for them. And God is the same with us. He's like, there's such a wonderful way of living and I don't want second best for you guys. Like, if our kids sort of get, you know, lazy and a bit lost or whatever we still love them but we're like man we see the potential in you guys we want the very best for you and we don't want you wasting your opportunities we don't want you wasting your potential and God is the same and so he he calls us to a life of holiness and it's not because he's like you better be good or else you've got to be a goody two-shoes or I won't love you no no he wants the very best for us. The principles of his law, the principles of his word are designed to bring ultimate happiness to us. Because if we're into like dodgy behavior, addictions, a, a lot of that sort of stuff is fueled by some deeper stuff. And it comes down to things like doubt and it comes down to low self-esteem and it comes down to feeling insecure and lost and unloved. And God doesn't want that for us. So he's going, you know, I want you to feel significant. I want you to feel loved. And I want you to feel like you belong. And I want you to feel my grace and my love. And, and all this other stuff is really holding you in bondage. Like it might have seemed a good idea when you started down that track. But ultimately it's a prison. And I want you to be set free from all that. And that's why he doesn't want complacency. He wants us to grow. And so the third option is what Paul calls the obedience of faith. He says, hey, we can have a life of holiness, but it comes out of our understanding of faith and of grace. There's something that Paul does in each of his letters in the New Testament that's really, really important. And sometimes Christians mess this up. And sadly, over our history, Adventists have been very good at messing this thing up. What Paul does is this. He gives you the good news first before he gives you the challenge. So you read through Romans, Ephesians, Philippians, all these letters, 
he spends the first half of it talking about how much God loves us and how we are saved through grace and how God has done everything we need to be saved and healed and restored. And then he says, therefore, in the light of this, live this way, right? So our, any obedience, any inclination to follow Jesus comes out of the sense that we are loved and we are saved by grace and the Holy Spirit is in our life. That's how he does it. So anytime we just start with rules and regulations, say, well, you should do this and you shouldn't do that, you should do this, you shouldn't do that, without that foundation of love and salvation and grace, like, we've started at the wrong end of things. Like, those things in and of themselves might not be wrong. A lot of them are probably right, but they don't have the right foundation. And so the, the obedience of faith says, hey, you know, I am loved, I am saved, I am accepted even when I mess up, and therefore because of that, I will live as a child of God. That's how it works. So let's have a bit of a think about this. Well, first of all, salvation is about what we call conversion. You, you know, a change occurs when we fully accept salvation, even though it's by faith. It has an effect on us. In Acts 2, when uh, Paul, Peter preached to the crowd and the people were convicted, uh, and they said, we want to follow Jesus, what do we got to do? He said, you've got to repent. Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the word repent literally means turn in a different direction. So you're facing this way and you're going, I'm facing away from God. I'm facing in the direction of my own sin, selfishness, lust, whatever. And then, whoop, now I'm facing Jesus and I want to head towards him. It literally means turn in a different direction, turn from looking away from God to looking towards Jesus. And so salvation has an effect on you. And it, this makes sense because when we really commit to a relationship, it has an effect on us. You know, you might not particularly like having a tidy sink. You're like, oh, man, I'll just throw all my dirty dishes in there and wash up once a week. And then you fall in love and your partner says, I really, really like a tidy sink. And you're like, oh, really? That requires a bit of effort. I've got to tie it out more often. Oh, man. And so all this selfish stuff starts going, I don't really want to do this. Why can't we just be messy? But then you go, oh, I love that person. So maybe it's time for me to change my behavior, not be such a slob. Awesome. What about waking up multiple times during the night when you're tired? Usually we're not into this unless you're an insomniac or don't like sleeping. Most of us like to have a decent night's sleep. But suddenly... A lot of us get to this point in our journey where we end up with a little person in our life and they're like, wah, wah, come visit me in the middle of the night. And you're like, oh. <laughs> and yet because you love your new little gift, suddenly things change. and You go, well, I'm sleep deprived, but I'm doing it because I love this little bundle of joy and I want to look after him or her. So... When we enter into a, a, a loving relationship with someone, it affects how we behave. It changes us. We don't just fly solo anymore. There's different priorities. And it's the same with Jesus. When we really encounter Jesus, he doesn't say, hey, you know, you have to be a good person for me to love you. But he's like, if I love you, you're going to start thinking about a few things and there's going to be a few changes along the way. A second thing in all this is the Bible recognizes the ideal and the real. So a lot of those things I read before about the cost of discipleship and, you know, how strong we want our elders to be in their walk with God and, and all this hardcore stuff about, you know, taking up your cross. It's talking about the ideal. And Jesus is unapologetic in holding up the ideal. But the Bible is also very realistic that we don't always reach the ideal. I love this few verses in uh, 1 John chapter 2, and they, he's almost contradicting himself, but there's, there's such a wisdom in this, because he says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So he's going, I'm writing all this stuff to you so that you can live God's way and not sin. But 
you're not always going to reach the ideal. There's times when you're going to mess up. There's times when you're going to sin. There's times when you're going to have a bad day. And don't worry. When that happens, you're still saved. Jesus has died for your sins. You have an advocate with the Father. It's okay. There's the ideal and the real. And we need to be kind to each other as well within the church, within the same understanding. Like we should aim for the best, but if people let us down, we're like, well, sometimes that happens. Because sometimes I'm going to let you down, sometimes you're going to let me down. We need to aim for the ideal, but realize that sometimes reality creeps in. And then, as I said before, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, through Jesus we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. He says, hey, as we focus on who we are in Jesus, obedience can grow out of that solid foundation. He says a similar things in Romans chapter 8. He says, hey, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully met in us who no longer follow our sinful nature but instead follow the Holy Spirit. So he's going, if you really understand that Jesus died for you and you're born as a new person in Christ, the power of the Spirit is unleashed in your life and then God's law can start be living out in your life. But that's the foundation, salvation, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Any obedience that doesn't come out of that is just us trying to pull ourselves up by our bootlaces and it's aim, aim, uh, it, it, it will fail. So thinking about this, if salvation is about conversion and the Bible recognises the ideal and the real and the obedience that grows from faith, that gives us some real clues how these three things go together. But I think the crucial clue is this. Salvation is based on a friendship with God. That's really what it's all about at the end of the day. I love this translation of 2 Corinthians 5 from the Good News Bible. Anyone who's joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from his enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. So Jesus has invited us into a friendship with him. And that friendship will have an effect on us. If we live as if we're atheists, if our friendship with Jesus has no effect on us, then something's wrong. On the other hand, God doesn't demand a perfect friendship either. Because you think about it, true friendships are not built or destroyed by an isolated action. But some people have a theology that thinks God thinks that way, right? So like if you have one unconfessed sin, suddenly you're not at God's friend anymore. I'm going, how does that work? It's like, okay, I've been at home and I've confessed all my sins. I'm like, whew, got a clean slate. I'm driving down to the church and someone cuts in front of me and I swear at them and the car runs into me and kills me. It's like, uh uh-oh, he swore and he didn't have time to confess his sin before he died. Am I lost? If that's how God works, it seems pretty harsh, (laughs) you know, because our friendships don't work that way. Like, you know, most of you people, when I see you, are nice and you smile and you say hi to me. But if you're having a bad day occasionally, you'll be grumpy. doesn't mean that suddenly we're not friends because you're having a bad day today. Like, we all have bad days, but it's the overall thing that counts. And surely it's the same with God. Surely that's what he judges us on. Are we friends with him in the big picture? The love and conviction in the relationship determines the actions So some days our actions as friends might be awesome. Some days they might be okay. Some days they might be a bit average. But hopefully underneath there's love and conviction that we're friends. And that determines the actions overall. And God has a very gracious friendship. Is it hard to be saved or hard to be lost? Because sometimes we make it look as if it's hard to be saved. Now don't get me wrong. Jesus does teach that it's easy to get distracted. That's why he says in the Sermon on the Mount, like wide is the way to destruction and narrow is the way to salvation. Because he's saying there's a lot of distractions out there and it's easy to get distracted. But God is really, really keen for us to be saved and be in his kingdom and have eternal life. 
And I would argue it's not hard to be saved, it's hard to be lost. God's not going, oh man, I might let you into my kingdom by through gritted teeth, reluctantly, and you better do really, really well or I won't accept you. That's not how God is. Because this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And praise the Lord for that, because I'm a sinner and I need to eat with my Saviour. Much as I don't want to sin like I used to and I want to try and grow, but, you know, it's, it's a hard thing. Sometimes we sin in ways we don't even know. Like 50 years ago, I would have been a more sexist and more racist person than I am now. That's just reality, even as a Christian, because back then we didn't understand all the things we understand now. And God's led us, hopefully most of us, if not all of us, on a journey. So sometimes we sin in ways we don't even realize we need a saviour. And we need that friendship with God. But God wants us to keep growing nonetheless. And the weird thing is, of course, in all this, sometimes we think, oh, 2020, we're so sophisticated now, we've got it all worked out. But in another 20 or 30 years, I'm going to look back at my 2020 self and go, oh, man, that's embarrassing that I thought like that. I don't, why did I ever think that way? And it's weird to think, well, what will it be today? Who knows? Maybe it'll be the fact that we were so blasé about not looking after the environment or something. We're like, oh, we didn't care too much about it in 2020. Now that we're in 2050 and the world's half cooked, we're a bit more stressed about it. Who knows? <laughs> but, you know, whatever it is, there's things that today that we don't get that worried about that one day we'll think, what were we thinking? So we're always growing. We never get to this point of perfection for some reason because people often think, huh, you know, if we could be like committed to God and have the Holy Spirit in our life, why can't we grow to the point where we're virtually perfect or perfect? Well, I don't know. It just doesn't work that way. We can grow, we can overcome, but we never get to that point where we've arrived. It's always the work of the lifetime. And in the meantime, God says, I understand. I am gracious. It's not hard to be saved. It's hard to be lost. But nonetheless, I call you to the ideal. I'm unashamed in calling you to the ideal of holy living and being the best children of mine that you can possibly be. Jesus is a very, very generous friend. Paul says in Romans 8, Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. He says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God's love is relentless and it'll keep chasing us. It's like Psalm 139, you know, where can I go to hide from you, O Lord? If I go up to the heights or the depths, you're there. You're always after me. You won't leave me alone. But nonetheless, we still have to be open to it. We still have to choose. We still have to be friends with God. He, he initiates the friendship. He offers the friendship. We have to be open to it. And one day we'll be judged. Were we friends with God? The criteria, I believe, will be kind. But God is still calling us to be serious and not blasé and complacent. We're saved by grace. We're called to holiness. And we have to face a judgment. And I think the key to understanding all this is ultimately it's about being friends with God. It's not about having a perfectly clean copybook on the day you face your judgment. It's about going, well, in basic terms, were they my friend? Because, man, I wanted to be their friend. Are our hearts open? Does Christ dwell in our lives? Are we asking for his Holy Spirit to lead and guide us? A friendship that's serious, committed, loyal, growing, but thank goodness doesn't have to be perfect. That's how it works. How healthy is our friendship with Jesus? Ultimately, the irony of this whole sermon is that it's got the wrong title. Because if my friend Jesus loves me, we don't ask, how good do I have to be? We say, how good can I be for my friend? And it's a good attitude to have in all areas of our life. Like I could say, what's the minimum I can do to be a father? Or what's the minimum I can do to be 
a husband and get away with it? Or what's the minimum I can do to be a citizen? What's the minimum I can do to be a pastor? What's the, you know, the least amount I can do without getting fired? What's the minimum I can do as a church member? Well, you can ask that question, but that is no way to live. Why not ask the other one? You know, this is a really good thing. My, my family, my church, my society, my country, they're good things, they're blessings. What's the best I can do? How good can I be for my friend? Because Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me when I'm good, when I do the things I should. Jesus loves me when I'm bad, though it makes him very sad. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. I pray that you guys will sense how God loves you when you're good and when you're bad and you want to be the best friend with him you can possibly be. God bless you. One thing that I really like about this next song is how whenever I feel like a lot of things are changing around me, God's love remains constant. So I invite you all to stand with us as we finish worshipping with Reckless Love.
There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, come after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. We just thank you so much for your overwhelming, relentless, reckless love. And Lord, we thank you for your grace, and we thank you that you want to be our friend. And we pray that friendship will inspire us to be the best friends that we can be. And on Judgment Day, we look forward to you saying, hello, friend. And we just want to say, hi, friend, back. We go from here as your servants to light up your world. In Jesus' name.